Hello and welcome to Tala Talks NICU. I'm Dr. Tala and on this channel we break down medical concepts and make them super easy for you to understand. Today we're going to be talking about inhaled nitric oxide. If you watch till the end of this video, I promise you that by the end you will know how nitric oxide works, when we use it and how we use it. So stick around. But first, let's start with a brief history. I mean, we are all used to standing around taking care of a sick baby, a term baby maybe with meconium aspiration syndrome or something that we're assuming has pulmonary, um, persistent pulmonary hypertension, and the SATs are kind of staying on the lower side, maybe the 70s, 80s, and we keep cranking up the FiO2 50%, 60%, 70%, and then at the back of everybody's heads, we're thinking maybe we should bring out nitric oxide. And so the respiratory therapist wheels out the tank and we hook the baby up to nitric oxide, and miraculously, the SATs start going higher. But think about how crazy that is, I mean, a gas, a random gas with one nitrogen atom and one oxygen atom, that's it, that's nitric oxide. How does that suddenly help the pulmonary hypertension in babies? And how did anybody ever figure that out? Well, it all started with some absolutely brilliant scientists in the 1970s and 80s who were working both at bedside as well as in the lab. And first of all, they figured out that what is causing the increased pressure in the lungs is actually constriction of the blood vessels, constriction of the arterioles in the lungs. So to explain that better, because it really is an important point, around every blood vessel, there is like a smooth muscle sheath, if you will. So if that muscle is constricted, then the blood vessel is constricted. It becomes smaller, the diameter of the blood vessel. So the same amount of blood is now being pushed through a much smaller volume. So what's going to happen? The pressure is going to go up. So this is basically what that persistent pulmonary hypertension is. The increase in pressure in the lungs because of the squeezed blood vessel. Eventually, it was found that the constriction and the dilation of that smooth muscle was dependent on a factor that the body produces called the endothelium-derived relaxing factor. So basically, if the body had produced that, then the smooth muscle would relax and the blood vessel would dilate. With more research and a couple of Nobel Prizes later, this factor was actually found to be nitric oxide, which loads of cells in the body produce the nitric oxide, and it works via the cyclic GMP pathway, which we'll talk about in a minute. I promise you it won't be boring, it is relevant. After this discovery, there was a huge surge in research and it was found that nitric oxide is actually really important as a messenger all over the body critically important in the nervous system, the immune system, and like we've talked about within the vascular system. But nobody really wanted to actually give nitric oxide exogenously, which means like produce the nitric oxide outside the body and administer it as a medication. Because well into the 1980s, nitric oxide was considered a really toxic gas. In fact, it was thought if the nitric oxide was exposed to oxygen, it would rapidly metabolize to nitrogen dioxide, which is extremely injurious to the lungs. And then eventually that would get hydrated to nitric acid, which basically is a component of acid rain. So really not good metabolites at all. In fact, in the 80s, it was considered so toxic that any canister or tank with nitric oxide on it always had like the skull and the crossbones, just warning everybody just how dangerous this drug was. So who actually had the guts to use this drug on babies or on patients and exactly why? And I will start with the why. The why is that one Dr. Ignaro, who first figured out exactly what nitric oxide was, also showed that hemoglobin molecules will gather up the nitric oxide very rapidly upon exposure and bind really, really tightly to that nitric oxide. So 
as soon as the nitric oxide reaches the hemoglobin, we don't have to worry about it then affecting the rest of the body. And this is a really important point that I'll bring up in a bit. So the logic was that even if there were bad side effects to this nitric oxide, if they could somehow get it into the lungs, then eventually that nitric oxide probably pretty rapidly will get to the hemoglobin molecules and kind of be shut down immediately without worrying about loads of systemic side effects. So with that knowledge, Dr. Zapol at Mass General, and he was one of the critical scientists involved in figuring all of this brilliant stuff out. So he was like, that's it, I'm gonna go for it. So he set up these elaborate lamb experiments. So they took all these lambs and they gave them a tracheostomy and then they planned on giving them nitric oxide. At this point, they were still terrified about the nitrogen dioxide. So everybody involved in the experiment, they opened the windows and they were all wearing gas masks during this experiment. So then they induced pulmonary hypertension in these lambs by using a chemical which actually constricts the blood vessels. And once they'd established that there was pulmonary hypertension in the lambs, they started giving inhaled nitric oxide. And almost immediately, they described this as a knock your socks off experiment. There was such a marked improvement after the nitric oxide was started. They gave 80 parts per million of nitric oxide in 60% FiO2. And they said within about 30 seconds, there was an immediate decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance as well as pulmonary pressures. But almost just as exciting, there was no change in systemic pressures. So this really showed that the nitric oxide was selectively just vasodilating the, the blood vessels in the lungs and not affecting the blood vessels in the body. And that brilliant experiment with lambs just about changed everything. Obviously, the next big step was to try this on an actual baby. The description of what the scientists did when they were trying the nitric on the baby is just absolutely fascinating. And there's a reference below to an article that you can all read. But basically, it was a baby with persistent pulmonary hypertension who was doing very badly, had SATs in the 50s. And the surgery team was standing there really ready to cannulate the baby for ECMO. And they describe it so nicely how well the baby turned around once they started nitric. So they started the baby on nitric and slowly titrated up to about 80 parts per million. And they said that almost immediately, the saturations of the baby went from 50 to 90%. And the baby was actually pink. And just like with the lambs, this decrease in pressure was just restricted to the lungs. So the baby's blood pressures in the body stayed stable. After this triumph, loads more studies were done. So a whole bunch of randomized controlled trials were done, which showed that nitric oxide consistently improved oxygenation in term and late preterm infants with persistent pulmonary hypertension. And they showed that using INO decreases the need for ECMO and decreases the mortality because it's associated with decreased ECMO. All of these studies resulted in the FDA approval of nitric oxide in December of 1999. The approval was specifically for term and late preterm babies called near term then. So babies born above 34 weeks gestation who were hypoxic because of persistent pulmonary hypertension. And the persistent pulmonary hypertension had to be diagnosed either clinically or preferably with an echo. And the rest, as they say, is history. Obviously, I'm sure a lot of you have used the nitric oxide and just seen the miraculous changes at bedside in these really, really sick babies. Another huge advancement in actually being able to get nitric oxide to so many different places was the finding that you can actually make nitric oxide from air by applying electrical discharge pulses to the air. So this has also really helped in the generation of nitric oxide within the last two decades. Let's move on to number two. How does nitric oxide work? And honestly, we've pretty much covered it. As you all have figured out, it decreases pulmonary hypertension. And the way that it does that is that it allows dilation or relaxation of the smooth muscle that's wrapped around the blood vessel. So when that smooth muscle relaxes, the blood vessels can also dilate and therefore the pressure within the blood vessels goes down. 
The way that it does this is exactly the same way that it does it endogenously, the way that the body does it. And that is that the nitric oxide stimulates the enzyme guanylate cyclase, which then increases the amount of cyclic GMP. The cyclic GMP ends up with the decreased amount of calcium in the cell, and therefore it allows the muscle to actually relax. By the way, as a slight aside, I'm just going to cover this. Viagra or sildenafil, which as you all know, we also use to decrease pulmonary pressures in babies, also works via cyclic GMP, but it's a slightly different mechanism. Viagra is a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor. So what does that mean? Phosphodiesterase 5 is responsible for breaking down the cyclic GMP. So if we t give a medicine that then inhibits something from breaking something down, then there will end up with being more cyclic GMP in the circulation. So both the nitric oxide and the sildenafil end up with increased cyclic GMP. They just use slightly different mechanisms to get there. One, the nitric oxide is increasing the production of cyclic GMP and the sildenafil is decreasing the degradation of cyclic GMP. So sometimes they can work in a bit of an additive way if you do use nitric oxide plus the sildenafil. So going back to the nitric, like we said, because it's such a small gas, we give it inhaled, so we give it in gaseous form with the oxygen or whatever, and because it's a small gas, it can reach all the way to the alveoli and then into the smooth muscles around the blood vessels and do its job very, very well. Right, now let's cover number three. What are the side effects of giving nitric oxide? Again, like we talked a lot about in the history, and this really was shown with many previous drugs that were tested to try to decrease pulmonary hypertension, was that the concern was is that if you are giving a drug to lower the pressures in the lungs, then there's a really high chance that it's going to lower the pressure in the body as well and actually cause hypertension. And like I said, this was found in a lot of the previous drugs that were tested. But the beauty of nitric oxide is that it isn't really systemically absorbed in that way. After the nitric oxide has kind of done its job in the smooth muscle cells, it continues diffusing into the blood vessels and then binds with the hemoglobin. And like we said already, hemoglobin loves nitric oxide. It binds very, very tightly with a lot of affinity. This way, the hemoglobin acts like a sink. It kind of absorbs all the nitric oxide immediately as soon as it gets out of the lungs. And so it prevents the nitric oxide from doing damage anywhere else. There's a lot more to be discovered about this whole relationship between nitric oxide and hemoglobin, but it is also the basis for one of the side effects that you do need to know about. We know that when nitric oxide reacts with a hemoglobin molecule, it changes the iron to the ferric state. So ferric is when it's got three plus positive ions. By the way, complete aside, a chief resident taught this to me once and I'm going to share it with you. You can remember that the three plus form of iron, which is ferric, is three plus and ferrous is two plus because when you say ferric, you're smiling. And so you should be smiling because you've got a whole other cation. So ferric is three plus. Thank you, Kerry. So going back, when this iron is oxidized to the ferric form, it actually causes met hemoglobin. Met hemoglobin binds tightly to oxygen, but it's not capable of carrying as much oxygen as regular hemoglobin. So these babies can end up becoming very hypoxemic. In fact, if your met hemoglobin level is really high, like above 10 or so, then your blood can start looking like a brownish color. And these babies actually end up, or these patients end up having to be treated with methylene blue. So if an infant is on inhaled nitric oxide, then you should definitely be testing the met hemoglobin level while they're on it. Normally shortly after they start on it and then maybe a day or Q24 hours after that. You'll pretty much accept met hemoglobin levels up to about one to two percent. Once it starts getting to closer to about five percent, then you really should be changing the amount of nitric oxide that the baby is on. Generally though, if you're sticking to the up to 20 parts per million of nitric oxide, then generally babies shouldn't have any issues with methemoglobinemia, but it should be followed. Right, number four, how is nitric oxide given? 
As you all know, we normally titrate through some sort of oxygen source. You could honestly theoretically give it without an oxygen source, just with kind of blended air, but it's highly unlikely that you'd want to give nitric oxide if you're not even needing any oxygen. So it can really be given with a full gamut of respiratory support, low flow oxygen, high flow oxygen. It can be given with the conventional ventilator as well as with high frequency modalities. So the oscillator as well as the jet. There's also nitric oxide available for transport, which is fantastic. Adjusting the way that the nitric oxide goes through all these different machines is not easy at all. It takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice. So generally, if nitric oxide is not given very frequently in the hospital, then a lot of simulations should be done, making sure that everybody, all the RTs especially, feel very comfortable setting up nitric oxide with the various different machines. Also, as a really important reminder, sometimes when a baby is on an oxygen source or, or a machine, that machine fails or for whatever reason we want to actually manually take over giving the baby breaths with positive pressure ventilation or something and, and take the baby off the jet or whatever else so it's important that when we're bagging the kid manually if they've just been on nitric then we have a system that we can continue the nitric while we're manually bagging them so the rt also has to take that into account that if for whatever reason this baby comes off the machine and we're manually giving them breaths the baby still needs to be getting the nitric Nitric has a super short half-life. It's between two to six seconds. So obviously we don't want to spend a lot of time without the babies on the nitric. Number five, when do we actually start nitric oxide? Well, the answer is pretty obvious when the baby is hypoxemic, when we're not able to get the oxygen into the baby and we're suspecting persistent pulmonary hypertension. At bedside, we often use the OI, the oxygenation index, and the higher that gets, the worse the baby's condition is. So generally, if the OI is above about 20 to 25, then at that point, we're really thinking of starting nitric oxide. Go back and look at the OI video that we made a few months ago. Basically though, the OI is gonna be higher if the mean airway pressure the baby is needing is higher, the FiO2 the baby is needing is higher, and generally I only calculate it if the baby's on like 100% or very close to that. And that number is also going to be higher if the PaO2, which is the dissolved oxygen in the baby's blood, is lower. Some people quote the 20-20-20 rule, which is that if your OI is above 20, then start nitric oxide at 20 parts per million and expect the PaO2, which is the dissolved oxygen in blood, to go up by 20. Generally, though, if you're needing really high FiO2 to maintain your SATs, then you should probably start thinking about using nitric. It would be nice to actually document that this is a persistent pulmonary hypertension, but like we've already been talking about, there aren't that many side effects to nitric. So you should not be waiting to get an echo before actually just starting nitric and seeing if it helps. Obviously, if it's a pretty well-known cause, of persistent pulmonary hypertension. So we have a pneumonia or sepsis, or we have uh, meconium aspiration syndrome, or we've got a history of pulmonary hyperplasia, then those are pretty kind of obvious reasons for why a baby might have persistent pulmonary hypertension. But even if you're not really sure, then just go ahead and start that nitric and then follow up with an echo. So why do we actually need an echo? And I talk about this a lot more in the persistent pulmonary hypertension video that we filmed. We need an echo because we use it as an indirect way to measure the pressure in the lungs. So in babies, we don't really insert up catheters into the lungs, the Swan-Gans catheters, to directly measure. So we need to have clues about how to figure out just how high the pressure is in the lungs. As you all know, the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs. So if we see that the right side of the heart is straining for any reason, then we can assume that it's having to pump against increased pressures. I'm not gonna go over more details than that now, go back and look at that PPHN video of different ways that we can look at that strain on the heart. But it really would be important to get the ultrasound of the heart or the echo just to confirm that this baby does indeed have PPHN and there are a few cardiac diseases and other diseases that can like masquerade as PPHN, whether it's an AVM, whether it's a TAPVR. So it's also important to rule out other cardiac causes of the PPHN. Number six, 
what dose should you give babies? Generally, we start at, like we said already, the 20-20-20, we start at 20 parts per million, which sounds like such a tiny, tiny amount, and it's so crazy that that makes a difference. Theoretically, increasing the dose above that, going up to 40 or 80 parts per million like they did in the lamb studies and everything, shouldn't really increase the amount of vasodilation that you have because you should have kind of already maxed out that pathway at 20 parts per million. And really going above 20 parts per million shouldn't help at all, but it does put you at increased risk of developing met hemoglobinemia. Having said that, we've all had babies at the bedside where out of desperation, we've been like, you know what, just go up to 30 or whatever. And somehow, miraculously, sometimes that helps. When you're ready to start coming off the nitric oxide, it shouldn't be stopped immediately. If you suddenly stop nitric oxide on a baby, then they'll get a huge rebound hypertension. So babies need to be weaned slowly off their nitric oxide. When their FiO2 is lower, definitely below kind of 75, 80%. Really, you want them kind of 50 to 60% before you're weaning and with a lower OI. And when you first start weaning, you can go a bit faster. So generally, you can go from 20 parts per million to either 15 or 10 parts per million. After about 10 parts per million, once you start getting to lower numbers, the babies may be more sensitive to the wean. So you might go eight, six, five, four, three, two, one, or whatever, maybe every few hours, every six hours, loads of units have loads of different weaning protocols. But it, this does happen sometimes when you get to kind of one or two parts per million, babies can really feel kind of coming off that last little bit of nitric. So you just put them back up to the previous level they were at and just wait a little bit longer. Seven, and our final point, when else do we give nitric oxide? So we said that the FDA has approved nitric oxide for term and late preterm infants who have PPHN. Where else has it been approved for? actually nothing else. And quite a few studies have consistently shown that nitric oxide does not decrease the incidence of BPD if it's given kind of prophylactically, and it hasn't really been shown to improve any markers of BPD if it's given as a treatment. But overall, trials of nitric oxide that have been done in very low birth weight babies they haven't really shown any harm when we've given the nitric oxide. So sometimes we really have given it to this population when we're absolutely desperate. So maybe you do have a 23-weeker that's literally needing 95% FiO2 and you're barely maintaining the SATs in the upper 80s and you get an echo and you see that there is right to left shunting. That is a baby that we would consider using nitric oxide in. Remember, nitric oxide does show its effects very, very quickly. So even in a baby like this, you could start the nitric oxide and if you're really not seeing any improvement within a few hours, then you can just rapidly wean that nitric oxide off. It is a very expensive drug, and if it's not working, it's not needed. So we definitely don't want to be keeping hordes of premature babies on nitric oxide for weeks. And that's it. I hope that you learned something. I hope that you found that history as fascinating as I did. And in the meantime, we would like to ask you to like this video and to subscribe if you're interested in neonatal content. Thank you so much again for being here.